We're um, getting towards, I guess we're almost about halfway, we're a little, little past halfway uh, in the book of John, so that's good. But uh, we're getting there. We're actually beginning, um, it'll turn into the last week, um, the full last week of Jesus' ministry on the earth in the next chapter. It begins and it moves at a very rapid pace. But tonight we're in um, John 11 and we're picking up in verse 33. We're in the middle of the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. A very um, exciting um, account of, of one of Jesus' greatest miracles just because of, of the magnitude of what he did in that moment. Um, when I was a young lad, my daughters love it when I start stories like that, and they always roll their eyes, but when I was a young lad, um, at Friendship, we had a Easter cantata, and uh, I remember for a couple years in a row, we did the same cantata drama thing, and there was a, a scene at the very beginning where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And yeah, I just remember how powerful that was and how neat it was as a, as a kid to watch that. And, to, and it just was intriguing and an exciting thing. And I uh, can't imagine, you know, it's, it's neat and it's exciting to watch it in, in a drama. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be there that day when that actually happened. Um, I don't know about you, but, you know, that, that would have freaked me out pretty good uh, to see somebody walk out who'd been dead for four days. But amazing. And that's right where we're in the middle of here is this account. And as you'll recall, Jesus took his time getting to Bethany where they lived uh, because he had already sought his father's will concerning Lazarus and, and God had bigger plans. Uh, it wasn't going to be a mere healing. This time it was going to be a raising from the dead. And it was all for the glory of God. And so at this point in verse 33, uh, Jesus is there in Bethany now, and he has met up with Mary and Martha at this point. And um, let's just dive into verse 33. It says, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, uh, this is uh, Mary, uh, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned in the spirit. Um, Jesus was watching the people around him and he saw the people there weeping and the weeping is like a wailing um, mourning and and a, a distraught a vocal uh, a weeping is what it's referring to here and so he sees this and he notices the heartache um, he sees what's going on and, and, and notice that when Jesus therefore saw her weeping Jesus saw it he also observed what he observed what it, uh, at this time was uh, the sorrow and sin um, that death can bring. I mean, uh, when, you lo when you watch someone who is grieving over the loss of a loved one, the, the, uh, the depth of sorrow is, is uh, painful. Um, I, I've, you know, had to do my share of uh, funerals in my days, and um, it's and never as easy, um, but it's certainly much more difficult when it's a young person. And um, I uh, did a funeral one time where I uh, was in the room with the mother the first time she saw her child um, since his death. And the, the, the way that she wept and fell to her knees and just couldn't stand uh, because of the depth of sorrow, it, it, it just has an impact on you. And, and it really affects you. I'll never forget that moment um, uh, watching that poor woman um, going through what she was going through. And so when Jesus was watching this, he was watching human grief, but he was also watching the sorrow. And, um, you know, even the sin. Sin, the Bible says sin brings forth death. And these are the products. Death is the product of sin. And so Jesus is observing all of this that's going on. The Bible says he groaned in the spirit. Now, it, it, it means he was deeply moved, but you know, I was reading about this, and that, that word there, groaned, actually means like a horse snorting, like where it's like an, uh, an audible, like bursting into tears, and um, he wasn't wailing like the people were, but it was a sudden just bursting into tears. He was making uh, a, a noise, and he was agitated. 
Um, the Bible says he was troubled there. He was physically moved uh, by what he saw at this moment. And so as Jesus is beholding all of this and he himself begins to feel the sorrow, verse 34, he says, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And so Jesus finds, he says, where have you put him? Where is he buried? And they said, let's go see where he is. And so a transitional verse there to verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, probably the most memorized verse in the Bible. Um, Jesus wept. And, um, you know, when we think about this, it's, it's, you know, you've heard people try to do entire sermons on it. You've heard people blow right past it and, and all these things. But he was, he was emotional. He wept. Um, God has feeling. Um, God loves us. He likes to be praised and worshipped. He has feeling, and we are made in his image, so we too have feeling. Jesus showed emotion. And notice, as we think about what Jesus is going through in this moment, though, he is, he is beholding two worlds. He's beholding the world of the Jews and Mary and Martha. In their world, there's sadness and pain. But what Jesus could see that they could not see was he could see where Lazarus was also. Lazarus was in paradise. No pain, no sorrow, uh, no suffering. And so Jesus is watching as it were, both sides of the curtain of the physical and spiritual realm. And so, of course, he's going to be emotional. Think about this. He's watching the people sorrowing because of the loss of the man on the other side, and he's watching the man on the other side who's going to come back to the sorrowing and the pain and the suffering. It's kind of hard to fathom that, but that's what he's seeing in this moment. And he weeps. Verse 36 then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And boy, were they right. Jesus did love Lazarus. It, we, we saw that at the beginning of the chapter. He loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. They were very dear people to him. And the Jews are watching Jesus weep, and they're watching him there at the, at the tomb, and they say, man, he really loved Lazarus. And they're correct. But you know what they didn't quite get in that moment? Was that he really loved them too. He really loved the people around as well. In fact, he's going to do something for their benefit, right? He's going to raise Lazarus for their benefit. He loves Lazarus for sure. But what they didn't realize in that moment was he dearly loved them too. He was there on the earth on a mission of love, if you will, a redemption mission because of the love of God for these people. So they called out his love for Lazarus. All right, and then verse 37. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Now, that's a good question. A question from the bystanders is, couldn't he have stopped this? I mean, they're watching Jesus weep, and they're thinking, man, if he would have just came a few days earlier, he could have stopped this. We've seen him open the eyes of the blind he had, a, he had an opportunity to fix it. Couldn't he have done it? Now, I don't know their attitude. Some people suppose that they were angry with, with Jesus, that he didn't come earlier. Some people suppose that they were bewildered. Why wouldn't he have stopped this? If he really cared about the guy, don't you think he would have came a little bit earlier and fixed this? The point is this. They, they make a question. The question is, could he have stopped this? The answer is yes, he could have. But what they didn't see... And what Jesus knew was there was a greater purpose than just um, healing a sick man. There was a greater purpose in saving a friend from crossing over into death. Um, we would do anything we could to save a friend or a family member from dying. If we could stop it, we would. But Jesus purposely did not because he had already sought his father's will concerning Lazarus. And so this was for a greater purpose. We know, as, we, as we've read, it is for the glory of God. A greater purpose than Lazarus living four more days. When you think about that, um, Lazarus missed four days on the earth. 
in the middle of his lives, <laughs> if you will. Um, there was a four-day where he was taken out of the earth, you know. And God says, you know, that moment, those four days of, of sorrow, those four days of weeping of the Jews is worth it for God to get the glory in the end. And so that was the plan here. Good question, fair question, but they didn't see the depth of what God was doing. And aren't we reminded that when we experience things that we don't understand why God didn't intervene in A, B, and C, we're reminded that God's always got a bigger thing going on than what these eyes can see. And, and we have to trust. It, it really comes down to trust. Not easy, but that's what it comes down to. And so uh, moving along here in the, in the passage, verse 38, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. So once again, he groans in himself. He had feelings. Um, keep your finger there and turn to Isaiah 53. You all know this one, but I think it really... Um, puts a stamp on tying this idea of Jesus' emotion with what God already knew about his nature and character. Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 4. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So we see, first of all, that Jesus is called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He's not above emotion. But what is in verse 4 is particularly astounding. It says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrow. Think about that. Not just in the moment of his death, not just in the moment of his taking our sin upon himself and literally becoming our sin so that God could judge it, but he bore our griefs and carried our sufferings, our sorrows, even in these times. As he was standing there at the grave of Lazarus, he was bearing griefs and carrying sorrows. Even in that moment. That's fascinating to me. And in, in understanding all that's going on there, Jesus knows it's not long until he's going to have to bear the wrath of God. And in that moment, he is literally hanging on and carrying the burdens of sorrow of those around him. And he even carried his own. Um, as, a, as a husband, dad, leader of any sort, whether you're male or female, any kind of leader, you're going to have to, from time to time, bear the burdens, the sorrows, and the griefs of the people around you. One, I think one characteristic of, a real, of real strength is, is the ability to bear others' griefs and sorrows. It really is. Having the, the ability to be strong enough to be there for other people when you're hurting yourself. That's strength. That's real strength. And um, Jesus, of course, would exhibit that. And he's there bearing the griefs and the sorrows of the others while he himself is weeping. Verse 39 says, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Now Martha is standing there and she's got this idea that Jesus misses Lazarus and so he wants to see him one last time, a final viewing, if you will. And it, it, you've been around funerals long enough to understand that during the service and the visitation time, uh, people come by and view and then after the funeral service, typically they have everyone leave except for the immediate family. And they say that the immediate family can have a final viewing before they close everything up and go on to the cemetery. 
of final viewing. One last look. You may or may not have been there. Those are tough, tough moments. It's tough it when you're the one peering into a casket looking at someone you love and your heart is breaking. It's tough as a pastor to stand right here and watch people you love looking in at the last time and watching the heart break right before your eyes. That's hard. And Martha has this idea because of Jesus' demonstration of emotion and because of his love for Lazarus that he wants to have a final viewing. Look what she says, verse 39. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, was dead, you see that, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. She says, Lord, that's not a good idea. Don't, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It's, it's been four days. He is going to smell. Don't go in there. Just don't do it. She has this idea he wants a final viewing, but Jesus has another idea, doesn't he? He's not going in to that tomb. He's going to call somebody out. And so he says, remove the stone. Take away the stone. Verse 40, Jesus saith, uh, saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? He says, don't you remember I just told you that faith brings glory to God? If you'll just believe, God's going to get the glory. Faith brings glory to God. One way that we can please God, in fact, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so, Faith pleases God. It brings him glory when his people are living by faith. And so he reminds Martha, didn't I tell you that if you'll just have faith, you're going to bring glory to God. God's going to get the glory out of this. And so he, there's this, I can't, I, I was trying to wrap my brain around all the people in this scenario. Even Lazarus. Because here's a guy who's just fine in paradise. He's there in paradise, maybe minding his own business for all we know. And then you have Martha and Mary, siblings, and you have friends, neighbors, Jews, and you have Jesus Christ and the disciples who are all watching this thinking, what in the world is he doing now? All these people, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around, putting myself in each of their sandals and saying to myself, what exactly is going through their mind in this moment? That's just crazy to think about what they're all thinking. And he says, remove the stone. And then, verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. So notice this. Man was involved in God's work. He told them, remove the stone. And then they removed the stone. You know, you and I can't do miracles but we can be involved in God doing them. I can't save a soul, but I can share the gospel and God can save them. Jesus can save their soul. I can be involved in a miracle, right? And, and here Jesus is involving man in his miracles. He's asking them to do what they can do and guess what he's gonna do? He's gonna do what he can do. And that's a great partnership, Aren't you glad he only asks us to move the stone away? <laughs> Aren't you glad he doesn't say, hey, go over there and call that guy out of the grave? We'd be up a creek, wouldn't we? No, he gives us involvement in his miracles, but he's the miracle worker. And so he tells them, go ahead and move it. And they went and they moved the stone away from the place where the dead was laid. And so then Jesus does something. He lifts up his eyes and he prays. Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. So look at what we've already seen in this. Jesus wept. We've seen him pray. And now, or we've seen him cry. And now we're seeing him pray. Pretty, pretty important chapter. He, he weeps. He prays. And he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. What does that mean? It means they've already talked about this. This conversation has already taken place between Jesus and the Father about what he's supposed to do about Lazarus. I don't know for sure, but it could be that when he got news, hey, Lazarus is sick, the man who you love, he's sick. 
It could be that Jesus went to his father and said, what do you want me to do about this? I don't know when it happened, but it had. He had already talked to God about, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. You've already heard me on this matter. Verse 42. And I knew that thou hearest me always. He says, God, we talked about this. I know you heard my prayer. In other words, I'm, I'm, t I'm saying this out loud for a reason. We've already talked about this, but we're going to talk about it again. Why? Look what it says. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou sent me. He said, God, we've already had our private talk about this. We already know what we're going to go on. But I'm saying it out loud so the people around can know that you have sent me. I'm calling out to you so they can hear me call to you and they're about to see you answer me in a miraculous way. So Jesus is making a connection between himself and the Father here when he says out loud, Father, I thank... You see it says he lifted up his eyes. Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He's making a demonstrative prayer for the sake of the people around him so that they'll say, wait a minute, he's calling out to the Heavenly Father. What is the Heavenly Father going to do about it? He's going to do something big which connects him and, and the Heavenly Father, which completely validates what he's been saying all along that he has sent me. This is huge. This prayer is huge. And so he prays out loud for the sake of the people standing around. Verse 43, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, and I won't do it, but he said, Lazarus, come forth. Put yourself in Lazarus' sandals for a second. He's in paradise. And all of a sudden, he hears the voice of God say, Lazarus, come forth forth he didn't have an option he probably would have liked to have stayed but he didn't have an option when God commands the people in paradise listen isn't it a shame that we don't all the time he had no choice it was an irresistible call Think about this. Jesus commanded a man to come from paradise to earth. And you know what he's about to do in a couple days? He's about to commend a man from earth to paradise when he's hanging on the cross. He has that kind of power. We're not dealing with a prophet, a mere prophet. We're not dealing with a mere man. We're not dealing with a, a religious a figure. We're dealing with God in the flesh. And he has the power to speak someone from the other side back to earth. And he has the power to, and the authority to promise someone on the earth paradise on the other side. That's power. That's God. Only he can make that call. And when Jesus connected to his father and he said, Lazarus, come forth, the world waited to see if Jesus and the Father were actually connected, what would God do with this prayer? Well, you know, verse 44, and he that was dead came forth. He had to. Lazarus, come forth. No, I'm good. <laughs> no, that's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> he came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, wrapped up like a mummy. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Now get this. A guy wrapped up like a mummy comes out of the tomb. How'd he do that? He floated. He couldn't walk. He was bound hand and foot. <laughs> when Jesus says come forth, supernatural things happen. A guy raises from the dead, and he can't move, so his body just comes out. Could you imagine seeing that? He comes out. How do you know that that's what it says? What is Jesus' next command? Loose him and let him go. Untie him. You know, he's alive inside of this wrap. Go untie the guy. 
they untie him and they let him go free. Now, we've talked about people being involved in the miracle, right? Moving the stone away, that's cool. Being a part of that job is great. Do you want to be one of the guys who goes and unwraps the dead guy? Do you want to be the one who goes up there and starts pulling back the, the, the rags? Kind of creepy, huh? I mean, you know, start with the head and come down and you're looking in the eyes like, you know, wow, he's, he's really there, you know. It really happened, though. You know, we think about these things sometimes. I don't know about you, but I can see them in my brain, and we think about these things, and we've, you know, Hollywood has done such a good job with special effects to make anything look realistic and, and, and possible, but this really happened. I don't know. God's power. Verse 45, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus, did, which Jesus did, believed on him. So, did you pick that up? Many of the Jews, which had come with Mary, and had, look what it says, seen the things that Jesus did. They watched him raise a guy from the dead, Many of them believed on him. So if many of them believed on him, what does that mean? Some did not. That evidence is pretty overwhelming. And they still did not believe. You know what this tells us? It doesn't matter sometimes how much evidence a person gets, some will still not believe. There are, there are hosts of people who call themselves atheists and they'll say, I need more evidence and that is not the case. That's not the case. That's a cover-up and a cop-out. See, that's pretty strong. I say that on the authority of the word of God. Because there are people who stood there that day in Bethany and watched a dead man come out of the tomb and some of them chose not to believe. You can't have better evidence. There's no such thing as better evidence than that. And there were people there that said, nah, I don't believe. So don't be surprised when there are people in 2017 who say, I don't believe that. I need more evidence. No, that's a cover up. You've got all the evidence you need. You're choosing. It's a choice. Verse 46. So many believed, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. This reminds me of that passage in Proverbs. Turn to, uh, keep your finger there and turn to Proverbs 6. You know God's hate list? Proverbs chapter 6, verse, beginning in verse 16. Proverbs six sixteen. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. So these are abominations to God. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Look at this one here. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. These were some people who watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead after having a conversation with his father and went straight to the Pharisees to cause mischief. Swift to run to mischief. And so they go to the Pharisees to tell on Jesus. Verse 47. This is an, another section of this passage. We're now no longer in Bethany. We're in Jerusalem. Then gather the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. And said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. You know what I find interesting? They didn't send out an investigation party. 
They didn't get the report and say, hey, send somebody back there to make sure this really happened. You know why? They knew what happened. They've seen him do things. That's why they said, what do we? This man does many miracles. This is just the latest and greatest. So what are we going to do about this? Well, you see what they called him to? Don't miss that. For this man doeth many miracles. They were half right. Verse 48, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. In other words, if we do nothing, if we let him keep doing these things, people are going to continue to believe on him, they'll revolt against us, the Sanhedrin, and then the Romans will come and take away our authority over these people. We can't let this happen. They weren't so concerned about losing their nation. They were concerned, concerned about losing their authority over the national Jews. And that's why they said, we have to stop this guy now before he gets a big uh, gathering. Because we're going to lose our authority. And they're not going to settle for that. So verse 49. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. I love that. Uh, in our terms, you guys are a bunch of idiots, is what he's saying here. You don't know anything. Don't you get it? Is, is kind of what he's, he's saying here. Don't you get it? You know nothing at all. Verse 50. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. So his idea here, he says it's in our best interest if one man, Jesus, dies, then all of us lose our authority. It's better off if that man goes away. We can't just push him off to the side any longer. We can't try to deny what he's doing anymore. He has to die. And notice what it says in the next verse. Verse 51, and this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. He didn't even realize he was being used of God to prophesy the truth. And not for that nation only, verse 52, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. That's us, all believers. Anybody who believes be gathered as one. There will all be one. We're the children of God. He's going to gather them because of his death, burial, and resurrection. So Caiaphas pro prophesies and doesn't even realize it. Verse uh, 53. So what happens? From that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. They plotted Jesus' death from then on. This struck me funny as I studied this. They just got news that Jesus had done what? Raised a man from the dead. And so their idea is, let's kill him. You're going to kill a guy who has the power to raise people from the dead? So you realize you're going to kill a guy who's going to raise himself from the dead, right? And... You're, trust me, it's going to be worse for you when he comes back from the dead. Because that will be the ultimate evidence and miracle that he is who he says that he is. It's folly upon folly that they want to kill a man who has the power to raise from the dead. It's just foolishness. But you know what? That's what we do. That's what, that's what a finite brain does. It thinks it's intelligent. It thinks it's wise. It thinks it's got God all figured out. We put him in a box like we can have some kind of authority over him. It, it's foolishness that these men would think this. They're trying to kill a guy who has the power to raise people from the dead. That would not work well for them. So they plotted to kill him. 
Verse 54, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into, unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Ephraim is about 15 miles north of Jerusalem toward Samaria, and it's, like it said, near the wilderness, on the way outskirts of town. Uh, not Finney Town to Cincinnati, uh, Ross <laughs> to, to downtown Cincinnati, okay? He's way out. He's moved out. He's not around the, the mainstream city anymore. He's not walking openly because now there's a hit out on him. And, and don't forget, he's not 15 miles away because of he's afraid. He's 15 miles away because it's not time yet. It's just not time. That time is coming. And there's some things he has to say to his disciples before that time comes. So he gets them out. So they go to Ephraim near Samaria. Verse 55, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Remember, Passover is a pilgrimage feast. So everyone, every godly Jew is going to be going to Jerusalem. And it's time now. We're beginning that last week. And everyone is going to Jerusalem. That's what they do. Verse 56, Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye? That he will not come to the feast? Now, that's another way of saying, you guys all realize he's going to come to the feast, right? You don't think he would miss this, do you? Uh, he hasn't missed one yet because he obeys the laws. He obeys the, uh, the, the, the laws of the feasts. He comes back to Jerusalem when all of us come back. To, so you all realize he's coming back, right? And so now you can see him kind of, you know, how the, <laughs> you know, they, they know that he has to come back. They know that it's the Passover, so he will come back. It's irresistible, and then we'll have him in our evil clutches. That's this much of their knowledge of God's big picture. God's big picture is, yes, he's going to come to the Passover, because the Lamb of God will take away the sins of the world. So he is going to come to the Passover. But not for the reason you think so. Not to purify himself and celebrate, but to become the final sacrifice. Verse 57. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment. That if any man knew where he were, he should shew it that they might take him. And by take him, they don't mean just to talk to him for a little bit. They had bigger plans. Jerusalem's most wanted. Not to be silly, but the word was out. He was the most wanted man in Jerusalem. If you see him, you let us know, because we're going to take him. Well, they thought... They had everything figured out. They didn't take into account that God had been working from before time as we know it began. And it was all coming to the climax. This one week in the history of mankind that would change everything. And it all is because he planned it that way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word God, we're, we're grateful at the demonstration of your power. It, it is fascinating to us, and we are so glad that we are your children. For, for a God so powerful and almighty as you are, I'm so glad that you're my father and that I'm not against you, that I'm not the enemy, that I'm not a mocker, that I am not... Um, in opposition and rebellion to you, God. I, and I'm thankful to be your child. And I have to say, Lord, we all understand this. It's because of your grace that we're your children. Thank you. Thank you for saving us and, and letting us be in your family. Lord, it does cause us to think about those who do not know you as Savior and how they go through life 
considering that they are pretty much controlling their own destiny. And Lord, I pray for their souls that the, the dear folks we're praying for and mindful of even now who don't know Christ, that someday, before it's too late, Lord, they would trust Jesus as their Savior. God, give us a compassion and a burden for them. Lord, I ask that you would uh, go with us as we leave tonight. I ask you for safe travels. And I pray, dear God, that we would uh, be a light and we would properly reflect you. In Jesus' name we pray.